Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar, Coronavirus Updates, Crisis Management, Infectious Disease, and Pandemic Planning in Your Organization. This event brought to you by Security Magazine is sponsored by Everbridge. I'm your moderator, Maria Henriquez, Associate Editor of Security Magazine. Thank you for joining us. Today's presenter is Regina Phelps, CEO and Founder of Emergency Management and Safety Solutions, a consulting company specializing in crisis management, exercise design, and continuity and pandemic planning. Don't forget to submit your questions. And later in the program, our presenter will address as many as possible. Today's event is being recorded and archived on securitymagazine.com. And now I am excited to turn it over to today's presenter, Regina Phelps. Great, Maria. Thanks for that kind introduction. It's a real pleasure to be with all of you today to talk about this new coronavirus. And we're going to discuss this outbreak through the lens of crisis management and uh, pandemic and infectious disease planning. Let me dig right into my agenda. First of all, I'm going to talk about the current threat. I'd like to talk about the 10 things that you need to be doing right now in order to be prepared. I want to talk about personal preparedness, and then we'll talk about some next steps. So briefly, let's talk about the new coronavirus. Now, coronaviruses, as you probably well know now, are uh, viruses that infect both the re upper respiratory and the gastrointestinal system of animals and birds. Uh, they have been around for centuries, and in fact, many of us have had them many times. They are one of the common cold viruses that every one of us have had. There's actually seven coronaviruses, seven as of our new one, that is. If you look at this particular slide, the first four coronaviruses that you see are the ones that we've had many times, very likely, and they have been circulating in the population for years. The last three are the ones that are the new additions, SARS, MERS, and then the new, and it does finally have a name, COVID-19, our new coronavirus. Let me talk a little bit about each one of those. Starting with the current virus that we have right now, we have 60,000 cases. Of course, that's an impressive number that jumped very dramatically yesterday by about 15,000 cases as China reorganized its information system. Uh, the death toll this morning as about uh, 6 a.m. was about 1,370 deaths. The fatality rate uh, is 2.3% today. It varies between 2 and 3% most days. Now, I contrast that to SARS, which circulated in the population from 2002 to 2003, uh, a little over 8,000 cases, 774 deaths, but a whopping fatality rate of 9 to 10%. And many of us very clearly remembered when that happened, especially if you lived in Canada, because they certainly were hit hard in the Toronto region. MERS, which is circulating now from 2012 to the very present, primarily in the Middle East, about 2,500 cases, around 858 deaths, but a whopping fatality rate of 34%. Uh, these diseases all have one thing in common, and that is that there's been a transmission from animals to humans. In the case of SARS, it was the civet cat. In the case of MERS, it's been bats to camels to humans. And as far as the new COVID virus, we're not exactly sure what it might be. Many people are thinking bats, but the research has not finally concluded what the source was. The current threat, as we know, did come from China, started in December of 2019, and there was a pneumonia cluster, <clears throat> pardon me, that uh, started in Wuhan, China. The first case was actually recognized on December 1st. <clears throat> Most of the initial cases were linked to visitors or workers of a particular market, the Hunan Seafood Wholesale Market. Now, on January 2nd is when the new virus was actually designated. So they actually had had a fair number of cases throughout December, and there was actually a genetic uh, DNA uh, replication or an RNA replication of the virus. At that point, then we actually recognized that we had a brand new bug on our hands. Um, it's, of course, now named COVID, as I mentioned earlier. That was named by the WHO on February 11th. Two-thirds of those people that originally had the virus in China were tied directly to the market, but of course that's changed markedly. And as I mentioned, the definitive origin of the illness is still unknown at this time. Our current stats, and they do change every day, and in some cases they change every hour, but I updated them this morning as of 6 a.m. Pacific. So as I mentioned earlier, the case counts now a little over 60,000 people, and that's since December 1st. The death rate, as I mentioned, 1,370. Uh, it's in 27 countries. 
Yeah, there's 14 cases now in the U.S., a new one just in Southern California yesterday. Uh, and there's also something called other locations, which is kind of uh, interesting, and that's because of the cruise ships that are actually um, having cases of this virus. Uh, no country, of course, is claiming them, so they have become the new nation, if you will, and they're actually counted under the category of others. Uh, the incubation period for the disease ranges from 2 to 14 days, with the average being about 5.2 days. Because it has, in some cases, a very long incubation period, that means that individuals could have the illness and actually be transmitting it to other people and not feel sick themselves. And so if it does go, in that case, 14 days, that means an individual's had a lot of exposure to potentially a lot of people. The first case of human-to-human -human transmission occurred in the United States on January 28th, and that was between a married couple uh, with a China connection, but still, that was a human-to-human -human transmission. This is a, a map that I would really call your attention to, and actually, it's a, a site by John Hopkins. I would highly recommend that you bookmark it, and when you get my slides, you'll actually see there's the link at the bottom of that page. It's updated uh, significantly about twice a day, but it also is updated incrementally on, uh, on certain occasions. And it does have the death toll uh, as well as the case count. You'll see on the left-hand side from top to bottom, it has the number of cases, uh, and I've actually got it towards the end so you can see the lower number of cases. Uh, and it also tells you how many people have recovered, uh, which is also really good to know, right? There's been 6,276 people who were stricken, <clears throat> seriously ill, and have recovered. I do also want to point out the bottom right-hand side. As you can see, there's an orange dot that at one point was almost going up at a straight diagonal line. It has now plateaued out a little bit, except for yesterday. And so there was a lot of interest amongst scientists and epidemiologists that it looked like perhaps the virus is actually starting to peak in Wuhan. But after they added the 15,000 cases, that's that spike you see in yesterday. So that sort of changed everybody's perception about where we are in this disease right now. Oops, let me go back. I'm going to talk about 10 things that you need to do right now. And I, I've talked extensively about pandemic planning and infectious diseases, but I think in this time frame right now, there are 10 action steps that all of you need to be doing in your organization immediately. I'm going to start, first of all, on talking about working on your infectious disease and pandemic plan. Now, I want to sort of give you a little bit of a history in, in some ways, if you will, and this goes back to April of 2009. So in our firm, we've been doing pandemic plans since about 1998. Uh, my background is originally in the field of nursing, and so I, although I'm a professional global crisis manager, uh, I actually have a uh, great interest in diseases, which I guess is maybe part of my gene pool. I'm not sure. So we've done lots and lots and lots of pandemic planning. And when we originally started writing plans, they were all tied to the WHO levels. And so it was really interesting in the global pandemic of 2009, which was an influenza pandemic, H1N1, that although we had a global pandemic, the disease was not terribly significant. There were a uh, little bit more than usual deaths. It struck younger people. But for the most part, most countries went around uh, with their daily life with very little impact at all. And so we realized that when you write a pandemic plan, you need to really think about how you write it, and it needs to be done in a particular way. So we're advocating that all of you, when you actually pull out your pandemic plans, you think about them not just from the perspective of a pandemic, so what we are calling is Infectious Disease Plans 2.0. And that is because, again, from our experience and many others, you cannot really tie a plan and its triggers to something global. So we had tied them to the WHO levels, it did not work, and it certainly wouldn't work for a localized disease like measles in your call center. So we changed our planning process completely. So what we do now, and I encourage you to do the same, is to write a disease plan that would work for any type of disease, so infectious disease and something like a global pandemic. Because my belief is, especially based on vaccination histories in the United States in particular, is that you have a much better chance of activating your plan, frankly, because you have something like measles in your call center or measles in one of your key operating locations than you are for having a global illness. Now, Diseases change a lot. So when you write your, when you look at your guidance, if you have a plan, 
or if you're going to write one, you need to think about that diseases can shift and change. And so you can't have highly specific detail about a particular disease in any plan because of this idea that diseases are different and they change over time and medical treatments and preventive measures will change. And so the other key thing about an infectious disease plan for you to keep in mind is that you do not control your destiny. Uh, who actually controls what you do in an outbreak is actually your local Department of Public Health. In smaller countries, it could actually be the National Department of Public Health. Now, things about the Department of Public Health you should keep in mind. They are staffed by highly professional nurses, physicians, epidemiologists, and so on. But they are often very small groups. And so they are often really tasked with trying to not only maintain the the health and safety of the um, area or the nation, but they have to deal with all types of issues related to other um, health matters. And so many times if you are having an issue, you need to reach out to them because you can't expect them always to reach back to you. They may be consumed by what's going on. But you need to understand that they have the ability to evoke what's called public health law. And in public health law, they have the ability to control exactly what you do in your organization, whether you're open or closed, and what kind of protocols and procedures you might need to have in place. So that's very important. They will issue very clear orders and dictates, and they will literally control your destiny. The key thing that you need to remember when you write your plan or when you look at your plan is all diseases are local. So you can write this big global plan, but the disease issue is in front of you, and that's the important difference than how we used to think about pandemic plans. They need to be written from the local perspective. So, for example, if you pull out your pandemic plan right now, and it's really focused on the big pandemic and nothing else, uh, you know, we're not having any cases of any significance in the United States. We only have uh, 14. So then you think to yourself, well, uh, what kind of guidance is in my plan? Because it's not telling me what to do, and there's nothing going on around me. And that's why it's important for you to write it in a perspective of what is happening right now. Now, you might say, if there's no cases in my organization or in my area right now, should I be doing anything? And I hope you still would be answering yes, because you should be thinking about what you need to do in order to be prepared if it gets worse. So at minimum, things like employee education right now and things like dispersing more hand sanitizers, and I'll talk all about that later, but you should be doing things right now in order to be ready. There are many things from the business side that I really pray and hope that you are thinking about. Many of my clients have had huge problems with supply chain disruption. Many companies that are expecting parts and pieces and things from China, things like fabrics and manufacturing pieces and so on, those things are becoming increasingly difficult to get a hold of because of this uh, factory shutdowns and this basic a problem in the area of um, the overall supply chain. So you need to really be looking at that. And if you haven't bought gloves or masks in the last 72 hours, I will tell you, you'll find that they're really hard to find. When you write an actual infectious disease plan, what you're looking for is a baseline of planning assumptions. So when we write our plans, we expect in our planning assumptions these four things to happen. We expect that you're going to manage this outbreak if it occurs in your area or region, utilizing your routine crisis management team processes. So I would expect and hope that most of you have a good crisis management program. And if you're a large organization, you should have a tactical crisis management team who's managing this on the ground, if you will, in all of your sites, not just in the headquarters sites, but in all of your sites. And you would have an executive team of the C-suite that is primarily looking at strategic issues. I expect that to continue on. The second planning assumption we have is that advice and counsel will be given to you by your Department of Public Health, and those are the ones you're going to follow. Uh, It doesn't matter what's in your plan. If they tell you to do something different, that is what you're doing. So they are in charge of all health emergencies. On number three, we expect that if you have an emergency response team or a group of employees who do medical response and so on, that they still will be doing that uh, as long as they're safe to do so. So if somebody becomes ill at work, our expectation is if you have that kind of service for your employees, that they would go ahead and continue that. And then lastly, we're assuming that your company is going to remain open as long as it's safe to do so. So those are the baseline planning assumptions that we're thinking about in our plan. We also ask you to think about different types of scenarios that you might want to be looking at. And there's basically kind of um, two ways to look at it. 
And it is primarily that we're going to have a global event or that you could have an event that only impacts you, that it could be catastrophic for you. And I will give you an example. I've had clients of mine over the last 38 years of our business who have had things like measles, neural virus, uh, drug-resistant tuberculosis in key departments. And all of a sudden, they had a huge human resource issue, not to mention a business continuity problem, closing of facilities and so on. So your plan should be thinking about those kinds of scenarios. And I want to say that when you look at doing an assessment right now in our particular situation, it's not so much as a fine, uh, a fine science, if you will, but it really is good judgment and consultation for the Department of Public Health. I've talked to many of our clients over the last three weeks who said, you know, I've got my plan out and I'm looking at it and I don't know what the trigger is going to be for us to activate. You know, when do we actually turn it on? And it's like, well, it really depends. It depends on what's happening locally in your area. If you start to have cases and they're serious and the Department of Public Health starts to intervene, then you're going to start ratcheting up your plan. If the cases appear in your area, but they're very mild and they don't seem to be of any consequence, you're probably not going to do much in activation. It's a very nuanced plan, not like many other things that we're used to in the area of business continuity or disaster recovery. When we write a plan, it basically has three stages. The first is the pre-outbreak preparation and planning. That means there's no risk in front of you, and life is good. That's where all of you should be right now. So if you have a pandemic plan, I would hope you have some sort of staging like this, and I would hope that you also have a really clear uh, group of things that you're doing right now and have completed, and you're sitting there waiting, and you're you're happy. The second thing is the threat assessment. So you've, you've detected a threat, and you've actually convened the appropriate individuals from your crisis management structure to actually do that. When we write plans for that, we we have an incident assessment team that makes those determinations. And all of our clients that we're working with right now, they've all ready for the pre-outbreak planning, and they've all done a threat assessment. And some of them are actually stood up and, and activated based on where they are in the world. And then lastly, once you decide to activate your plan, you're going to probably operate in basically uh, four areas, and it's going to be based on impact and severity. And the way that we categorize those is pretty much about a human transmission. Because in a disease, that's what it's about, is who's getting sick and how many. So we range our plans all the way from the minimal, which is minimal human transmission, and in our case, that's the yellow at the top of that slide, all the way to the bottom, which is gray and uncontrolled, which means at that point, you can bet you're not open at all. Uh, and very likely you may not be open for severe human transmission either. But what that does do is that when you have this gradation in the plan, you can pull it out and you can see where you need to be at any given moment and how it actually applies to the key departments. And when we write a plan, we usually are using these departments as the key ones that we would be focused on. So obviously business continuity, they have a huge role to play here. But in the business units, go back to your business impact analysis, your BIA. What's time-sensitive? Mission critical. I would expect that those departments have got clear guidance about what they're going to be doing because they might be in a situation for protracted work from home, uh, which brings in a whole lot of issues or difficulty in actually coming to work if they are required to be there, and I'll talk more about that in a bit. But you can see there's communications and crisis management, and the list goes all the way down. There's 12 that we normally write on. Uh, And again, the business unit one could be quite extensive, depending on the kind of company and what your uh, business impact analysis would say. The last thing in particular I want to mention about a pandemic plan is that I think one of the most important things that all of you can do is employee categorization. And let me explain about this, because frankly, this is really helpful not just for a pandemic, but it's super helpful in the case of just regular business continuity planning. What we ask all of our clients to do is to actually categorize their employees in one of four categories. Category one are those people that are time-sensitive, mission-critical. They have to be at work. They cannot do their job remotely. So stop and think of your business. What's time-sensitive, mission-critical, cannot do it remotely? Security officers, great example. Manufacturing, healthcare, uh, other types of services of which there is no option. You have to be physically on the job. Category one, you need to know how many of those are. And the reason that becomes important is if people have to be there, I just think if it's going from minimal transmission to more moderate transmission, 
How are they going to be safe at work? That is hugely important, hugely important. And if you don't figure that out, they're not going to want to come. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But that tells you about how much personal protective equipment you might have, how much cleaning you might need to be doing, with what frequency. What about social distancing? It tells you a lot. But if you don't know how many Category 1 people you have, you're kind of in the dark when you're uh, trying to do any of your planning. So it's really critical for you to understand that. Category 2 are those people that are mission-critical time-sensitive, but they can work remotely. So this tells you a whole laundry list of other things. Do you have sufficient VPN capacity to accommodate all of those individuals? Do they have the right equipment to work from home? You know, the best way to actually test that, really test it, is to have a critical department who you think is time-sensitive, mission-critical, and can work remotely, work at home for five days in a row, an entire week. And what you're going to find is really helpful. Because if they are time-sensitive, mission-critical, and they can work remotely, you need to understand if there's little nuances that make that problematic. So, for example, do people need to scan things periodically and they don't have a scanner at their house? Do they have a slower Internet and they're not able to participate in certain meetings or other activities? Do they have the right laptop? Do they have the ability to work collaboratively as they normally do? The only way you frankly know that is if you make people do it for a sustained period of time. Because every one of us thinks, yes, we can work from home remotely, but we haven't done it really for production for a significant period of time. So I have clients of mine who do a test five days. And if they can successfully do that, they're deemed work from home. Category three are those people that do not perform uh, time-sensitive mission-critical business functions, but they can work remotely if feasible. And frankly, they could backfill maybe a one or a two. It's nice to know how many of those you have and who they are. And then lastly, category four are those people that do not perform any time-sensitive or mission-critical functions, and they cannot work remotely. So that might be perhaps like a receptionist. So what this does do is it helps you a lot understanding what kind of resources you have, not just for this great uh, disease outbreak, but for any kind of business continuity issue. I ask my clients if you have some sort of HR database that you use, that you would actually create a field and you would actually include categorization of all employees in their HR database so that you can sort them very quickly and you can see what you have. And from a resource perspective, it is super helpful for facilities and business continuity and security and technology and so on to be able to understand what they're dealing with. The last part of the plans that we write include a series of appendices that give guidance that uh, that is deeper for those departments in particular where there are issues. So, for example, in human resources, all about education and what you should be doing, frankly, right now uh, for employee education and diseases, how you would be monitoring employees to know whether they're sick or well. Certainly, your emergency notification system could be super helpful for that. Uh, I, you need to look at compensation and benefits. What kind of um, benefits would you continue? Or, or what if they can't work and they ran out of PTO and all of that stuff? You should make a decision now, and then you can always revise it at the time. And then what about your crisis management, your incident management team? What about guidance for janitorial and cleaning, uh, respiratory hygiene policies like, you know, making sure that people cough into their hand um, or, excuse me, into their, their sleeve, not their hand, that they would, uh, you would uh, discontinue handshaking. And you might really discontinue meetings, which would not be great uh, because you don't want people all breathing in the same, on each other in the same room. Things about security and safety would be things related to visitors and vendors and how you're dealing with people and what, what's appropriate as far as lobby hours and how you make sure that people aren't sick. And then things related to travel, which I'm sure most of you, I hope, have looked seriously at travel and travel restrictions now. So I have a question for all of you, and we have the ability for you to tell us in your own, in your own office, in your privacy of your own space, and nobody's going to know what your answer is, but I'd love to know. How many of you do have a pandemic plan? And your answers include, yes, and we recently revised it, yes, but it needs revision, no, we are planning and creating or acquiring a plan, and no, we don't think we need it. So I'm going to give you just a moment to think about what those answers might be, and then we'll see how we did. What I found for a lot of people is that they had a plan, but they haven't revised it, and they probably had it since 2009, and it needs a lot of work. 
um, which is not a surprise. So let's see kind of what our answers are looking like. So let's see who won the race. Uh, so far it looks like, yes, but it needs revision is our top vote getter here. Oh, no, actually, yeah. That's actually, as far as numbers of, uh, no, you're right. It's actually, we, we need to create or acquire a plan. Super important. Uh, you need to think about that now. Um, yes, we've revised it, 24%. Yes, but it needs revision, 33%. Yeah, 5% of you don't think you need it, which I think it, that's good. Uh, interesting. I'm sort of surprised that you'd be here, but um, I might change your mind by the end. I don't know. I hope so. Okay. The second thing I want to talk about is situational status. This is a report that you should be issuing ideally for your crisis management and your executive team. This is really important. Uh, there's tons of information out there. And how do your leaders have the right information to make the right decisions? And that's what I would like you to really stop and think about right now. So when we look at situational awareness, first of all, let's start with the definition. It's really the ability for you to identify, process, and comprehend information and so that we can make appropriate decisions. So essentially, it's knowing what's going on around you. And sometimes that is hard to do. There's a lot of information. How can you peel it all back to make some decisions? There's two things you should all be doing right now. One is to collect information. And that requires you to collect it, observe it, and compile it in some way. And then you have to process it, which means you have to assess it and orient yourself to what it actually means. So what do I mean by all of that? First of all, I would hope that all of you are actually in this process right now, which is actually collecting situational awareness from your internal sources. We've asked all of our clients, especially those that work in Asia, that they should be doing this every day. Asking what you need, what you, what do you need to know from all your locations? And basically, I know it's going to revolve around five things. What's going on with your people? What about your facilities? Technology? Any impact to your business operations? And is there any impact to reputation and brand? Let me peel that back for you a little bit. So these are kind of a sample of questions that you might want to think about. So, uh, you know, what do you need to know about the disease? What's the disease front in that area of that location of your business if you have more than one? So I've asked people to say, give me, the, give me the snapshot of what's going on in your area or region. So, for example, if, uh, in Thailand or in Singapore, places like that where we have clients, you know, what's, what's happening on the ground? Are people wearing masks? Or, you know, what's, what you, what's your experience there? What's happening as far as social media and public reporting? And is the government making any changes? Because some places the government has really clamped down and they require everyday temperature testing and social distancing and so on. And then a really important question is, what is your employee illness? And compare it to the usual of last year. So if you start to see a spike or you're seeing a general increase, what's going on? Do not be flat-footed. What about your facilities? Are you doing anything in additional cleaning? Are you, uh, do you have sufficient uh, supplies? Uh, that's a big issue, especially uh, in many of my clients who are in Asia. Technology, are you looking at things such as uh, bandwidth and of your organization? Do you have, uh, are you seeing an increase in cyber attacks? That's actually been a big deal where scammers are really working on that, and I'll talk about that later. Any other technology problems? What about business operations? Do you have any impact on production or supply chain disruptions or quality? Or do you have customers that are being concerned? Many of my clients are now having customers who are calling them, asking if they have a plan in place right now, and they can depend on them uh, as a vendor uh, if things get bad. And then lastly, reputation brand. Are you being uh, noted in the news? Um, are your people maybe tweeting or posting things on Facebook? Um, do you have your holding statements ready? I'll talk about this in a bit. Uh, super important. And do you have your crisis advisors on the ready? Those are things I would love to have you know about. So that's internal to your organization. You should have a really good list of external sources. Obviously, the WHO and the WHO's actually, their website this time for this outbreak is really pretty good. The CDC is also quite good. Uh, your local department of health, what's going on? Do you have a contact person there? Do you know somebody you could call by name? Really good to know that. Uh, and do you have an infectious disease doc that you could reach out to for some co consulting, especially if the Department of Public Health has made some requirements of you and you're trying to see, you know, if this is realistic or makes sense. Uh, it would be good to have somebody you could bounce something off of. And then you want to have good news sources. I will tell you there's been some incredible stellar reporting, both, both the New York Times, the Washington Post, but also Bloomberg News has done a fabulous job, and The Guardian has a very robust U.S. edition. All four of those have been really solid reporting um, about not just the disease itself but the economic impacks. Uh, NPR has also been quite good as well. 
I would also say if you're looking at any social media post, you should double, triple, quadruple check it because there are some weird things out there. I'll just tell you, and I'll show you an example of this. There are so many conspiracy theories, which started about the day after the virus really started to get interesting around January 20th, where this particular one um, says that now that there's a virus that's been introduced in the United States by the CIA and is trying to do mass vaccinations for everybody and it's all about the deep state. I mean, there's some weird things out there. So please. Be very aware of those things. And if you're going to post anything, triple check anything you do. I've even seen professionals I've known for years put some of the weirdest things on their LinkedIn page. The next thing is that once you have this information, you've got to process it in some way that's actually helpful and meaningful to your management team and your crisis leaders. Uh, And that's what we call a sit rep report or situation status report. So I would encourage you to then, you know, pull together the internal information, the external information, and be able to put it in a way that's digestible and a quick read. Uh, you want to then disseminate this to your tactical crisis management team, but also you want to be giving it to your executive team. And if you're activated, like many of my clients are right now, uh, you would want to be developing uh, an incident action plan based on your SITREP document. And this is all uh, core aspects of crisis management, which I hope you've got a good, robust plan for that. Um, And I would encourage you to look at a really great SITREP report that actually the WHO is doing right now. It's actually kind of shocking. Um, They have historically done not very good uh, SITREP's reports, but they changed their report in this particular um, disease outbreak, and it is stellar. And this is just a little clip of what it looks like. Uh, And when you open this page up and and think about it for your plan, a report that you're issuing to your people, on the right-hand side, it's got the situation status about what's happening in the world. Uh, on the left-hand side, there's some big highlights. You could do exactly the same thing in your report. You could report what's happening globally, but also you could report what's happening in your organization, and you could make it so clean and easy that people can just get it without having to dig through it, which is what I found some of my clients' reports, and I'm just encouraging them to look at brief, quick-to-read, powerful documents, and certainly I think the WHO document is really a good example of them. So I have a question for you now. I'd like to know, are you currently creating or distributing some type of sit stat report, whatever it might look like, to your crisis management team executives and or others about the coronavirus? And I would ask you to look at, yes, we're doing that. No, we're not doing that. But yeah, maybe we should do that. And we're not currently. So let me give you a moment to think about this idea of developing a sit stat report for your crisis management team and your executives. Okay. It looks like a lot of us are. That's great. So uh, uh, 41% of us are actually doing a SITSTAT report. 33% of us are not. 24% of you are thinking about it. One of the things I would just say uh, before I go on to my next topic is why this is actually important. One of the things that I think is critical for people both in security management, crisis management, business continuity, is that we have to really prove on a daily basis that we're providing value to organization. And this particular disease outbreak gives you a great opportunity right now to actually provide value every single day in a very tangible way that uh, crisis management leaders, executives can actually benefit from. So I would say it's a great opportunity for you to shine, and I would really encourage you to use it. Okay, let me just talk through my seven other items. Uh, number three, assess the impact to your company's supply chain. And, you know, when you stop and think about where everything comes from, there's kind of a one-word answer for that. It's China. The difference between SARS in 2003 and the impact now is night and day. We're going to start seeing huge supply chain issues. Many companies are feeling them already. There's already been concerns expressed in medical supplies, pharmaceuticals, um, manufacturing, uh, electronics all kinds of pieces and parts that go into things like automakers, et cetera. So there's many ways you could be impacted. Uh, Even if you're not uh, in a company that makes something, but maybe you have a critical piece of equipment in your company that where a key part is made in China. So it can be a huge deal. So I've encouraged all of my clients to really work, work with their key departments and their procurement organization and really to do a good supply chain assessment. It's not just knowing what company you buy it from, but the question is, where does it come from? Uh, and that's the big question. And I would really encourage you to be reaching out to your key suppliers and vendors right now and mapping your supply chain operation, really from the total process from the suppliers 
the internal aspects and your customers, and really are there things that you need to do to mitigate this? Maybe getting alternate suppliers. If you have any single sources in particular, you want to be able to divest that as much as, as quickly as possible. This is just one tiny example of this. So Wuhan actually is 11 million people, uh, it's a, which is a big, big city in the United States. It's a tiny city in uh, China. But they are really a major hub of industrial uh, activity. Their economy is the size of the nation of Sweden. Um, and you can just see on the left-hand side of that slide, there's a lot of things that they make. Now, many of these things may not impact you, but some may might. Uh, often yarn, so for folks that are in, uh, in retail clothing, things like glass, uh, and then you'll see lots of other different chemicals, cars, beverages, uh, construction-related materials. Um, there's a lot of things that come out of this particular area, and there's a lot of factories in particular, like aerospace and defense, where uh, they're looking at major supply chain disruptions based on what's happening in China right now. So look at your supply chain, and don't be flat-footed because you have not taken that time to assess it. The fourth issue, critically important, is about communication. I really said to all my clients, this is, if you don't have polling statements for this right now, if you haven't got communications for this, you need to get on this right now. And first of all, your communication should be about things that related to your employees, about what you're doing. Have you activated your plans? Are you monitoring this? I mean, do people know what you're doing? Are you talking about it at all with your staff? That you should, because it's in the news every day, and people are wondering, do you wonder what my employer is doing? You should be talking to them about that. But you should also look at all of your key stakeholders. You should have preparation for statements to all of them. Many of my clients are being talked to by, uh, reached out by investors. They're being reached to by big customers, uh, regulators. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? You should not be flat-footed. So holding statements for all of your key stakeholders, all of your initial communications, and you should think about having communications for when you get a case, which could happen anytime. And then what do you say? What do you say to your employees? What do you say to your uh, community? What do you say to your customers? Um, that should all be figured out right now. So you're not, again, stuck when a communication needs to be issued. A really good example, I'll have to tell you, of really forward-thinking communications has been Princess Cruise Lines. I don't know if you followed them. They're the poor souls that have been stuck, as you might know, in Yokohama, Japan. Uh, I think they're up to 135 cases now. Uh, really an awful situation, and they're doing the best they can possibly do in really tough situations. They have got a very good page. So if you go to their main homepage for Princess Cruises, you see that red box at the very top that says Update. You click on that, and it will go to a page that will tell you exactly what's going on. So this was, I pulled this from a week ago, but they'd update it every day. They have put out some incredible videos. I've actually posted those online on my LinkedIn site uh, where managers, senior managers have been giving videos that are for the general public, but also for guests, really trying to communicate in a very uh, open uh, fashion what's going on and, and, and how they're managing it. A, way, a great case uh, in crisis management and crisis communications. Um, the bad news for them uh, and anybody who's on a cruise ship with diseases is that every time there's a new case, it resets the isolation clock. So people that are actually quarantined on the Diamond Princess in Japan, uh, they wondered for a while how long that was going to be. But on last Friday, the health department in Japan said every time, and this is the general practice, every time there's a new case, the clock gets reset. So now it's been extended to February 19th, and I think because of cases yesterday, it's going to be reset again until probably around sometime in mid-22 mid or 23. So this could go on for those poor folks for a very long time. Number five, I would really hope that what you're doing is you're educating your employees. I mean, frankly, I hope you're doing that anyway because it is still the flu season. And you want to be trying to get them to think about health at work. So things like good hand washing. I put signs up in your bathrooms. I put signs up in all kinds of places. And I would really be educating people about the importance of good hand washing. Cough hygiene, coughing into your sleeve, uh, and making sure that if you, don't, if you can't do that quickly, that you have a tissue or something you can cover your mouth. You know, the last thing you want to do is cough into your hand because then your hand, of course, is filled with whatever was in your lungs, and now you start touching things all over the place, which is why cruise ships in particular are so problematic because handrails and buttons on elevators and doorknobs and so on. Uh, but that's also the same for your office, to be honest. So think about cough hygiene. Also think about things like uh, many of my clients now have started circulating hand sanitizers at the beginning of every meeting. 
just passing it around the table. Um, another great example. And really encouraging people, if they are sick, stay home. There's something called presentism, which means that you actually are sick, but you come to work anyway. People don't want to use their PTO or whatever, and so they decide they're just going to come to work, and next thing you know, everybody is sick. And that's such a great thing. My last question for you is about employee education. I believe it is essential in disease transmission, and I want to know, do you have any employee health awareness programs for hand washing, cough hygiene, or staying home when you're sick? Uh, so I'd love to know, what are you thinking? Who is doing health education? Who's pushing that with their employees? And wow, we're doing really good, it looks like. That's great. Uh, this is super important, and you always have the opportunity to push this out to your employees. Uh, and it's in everybody's best interest. It's frankly a business continuity issue in, in my mind. And you can see we're actually doing pretty good. Well, uh, 78% of you uh, have something in place, which is great. 9% Nine, of you don't, and 12% of you wish you did. Number six, market the importance of your company notification system, emergency notification system. I hope all of you do have an emergency notification system. Uh, it could be so helpful in a disease outbreak. You could use it for polling your employees to see if they're sick, if they're home, and if they're sick, and if they're okay. You can also be giving them uh, urgent information about what to do. It's only as good as the information that's in the database. So you need to market it to your employees, and this is a great time to do it right now. Make sure you have things like a home phone number, that you have a personal mobile, that you have home email, and you want to market this to your, empo to your employees so they get the value of this. And now is when you should be conducting uh, emergency notification system exercises. I would ask that you review your BIA BCPs through the lens of an infectious disease. I know we all have BIAs, but you know, when we look at this, we don't think that we're going to be out for a protracted period of time. And so, yes, we think, oh, we could work from home, or oh, we could do this, but we don't think about days, maybe weeks, or longer. Do you have guidance in your plan, your pandemic plan, infectious disease plan, about staff categorization, social distancing, which I mentioned earlier? Technically, that's where you have three feet around a person, or that's socially distanced. So in a call center, do you have three feet all the way around somebody? Most places don't. Um, could you shift work to another location because your headquarters closes down? Could they really do that? Can you give them all the work? Have you ever tested that? You ought to be thinking about that. How about cross-training? And then the other thing is really reevaluating what is truly, truly critical. I know we say that we do that with the BIA, but I'll tell you, when if you have real serious illness in your office and you're closed for a period of time, that whole critical list changes, and you should really be thinking about it from that perspective. Number eight is super important because many of us are now heavily dependent on third-party vendors, and the question is, what the heck is going on with them? I hope you've reached out to them now. Uh, I'm sure that many of you have a dependency on third-party vendors whether it's your cloud computing system or it's your security officers or whether it's your help desk or whether it's uh, the people that do your shipping and receiving, whomever it might be. Um, what's going on with them? Do they have a disease plan? What's their status? Are they doing okay? Uh, how would they answer these 10 questions? And the big question you have for all of them is, are they going to be able to deliver for your particular company if a bad thing happens? And that's really, really important. Number nine, have you inventoried your personal protective equipment, which is masks and gloves and hand sanitizers? Uh, and they could also be uh, cleaning agents for your office environment or your laboratory or whatever you might have as a business. It's important that you inventory all of this stuff. And the question is, how much would you need if you had to really go to Category 1 people at work only? Could you close several floors? Could you close sections of a building? Could you minimize cleaning in some areas so you can maximize it in others where people are? Those are all the kinds of things that you should be thinking about right now. And my last one, number 10, super important, and this has been really, a, of course, scammers and hackers are always trying to get us when we're thinking about something else. Uh, and as the coronavirus has continued to spread around the globe, there has been a real increase in phishing emails as well as just general malware distribution based on um, people's fear of the coronavirus. So IBM and Kapersky have been doing studies and releasing that, that there's a huge increase in hackers sending out spam emails to people telling them that they have really good information about the coronavirus. Uh, and then, of course, then you get an infected phone or an infected laptop or a desktop. So you need to be educating people that they need to be cautious about this particular issue because it is increasingly a problem. So that's a summary of all the things that I want you to be thinking about and doing. 
But let me also just uh, talk and end with about personal preparedness. It's hard not to talk about a disease and not talk about you and your family. So, uh, first of all, wash your hands a lot. And I mean a lot. Um, you know, 20 times a day would not be a bad number. Um, once an hour, um, if you get that moving around, go wash your hands. Uh, the idea is to keep uh, your hands as clean as possible. That's how you get sick. Masks are, um, uh, aren't that helpful, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, avoid touching your face, which, by the way, is really tough. Probably many of you are listening to me, and maybe you're leaning on your hand or you're scratching your forehead or something like that. Most people touch themselves, studies show, between 18 and 20 times an hour. If your hands aren't clean, you touch your face, what happens? All those microbes and viruses that might be on your hands can get near your airway. You inhale them into your lungs, and you kind of get the picture. So washing your hands but also not touching your face is really important, and your eyes because your mucous membranes in your eyes can uh, also receive those viruses. Avoid sick people to the best of your ability. Um, Just avoid them if at all possible. Using hand sanitizers if you can't wash your hands. So if I'm on uh, public transit here in San Francisco, I have hand sanitizer with me. If I'm on an airplane, I use it all the time. Uh, just be smart and make sure that your hands remain clean in those kind of environments. Should you be wearing a mask? People ask me that all the time. Uh, if you're around sick people, so if you're in an office environment and somebody's coughing right next to you, i put a mask on. <laughs> if you're in a plane, I would definitely put a mask on if they're within two rows of me because uh, studies have shown if they're within two rows of you, your chances of getting sick are actually very good. But should you just be wearing a mask walking down the street? And the answer is no. The best thing you can do is wash your hands, don't touch your face. And then lastly, be smart. Uh, don't panic. Uh, it's very likely, uh, the CDC released today, it's very likely this is going to end up being a pandemic and it's going to be all over the United States at some point. But this is not a time to panic. It's a time to, to get ready. So from a next steps perspective, this is what I would really encourage you to do. Uh, review your crisis management plan and processes because that's going to be the pillar of what drives this. And you also want to pull out that disease plan I talked about earlier and you re- want to rethink it. And if you don't have one, you better get one. If you don't have one, Start writing one or hire somebody to do it for you. And then lastly, I would really encourage you to take this threat seriously. Um, It is an opportunity for us to look at our plan seriously, but as I mentioned, it's an opportunity for you to provide value to your organization. And I would also say to you is that it's really important for you to think about that this could last a long time. So I'm asking you to think about be prepared for the long haul. Pace yourself. Um, This could go on for weeks. I've had clients already activated, fully activated for a month. Uh, be aware of staff fatigue, your own fatigue. Um, you're going to burn out. That's a problem. So look at staffing charts and really realize that this is not going away really soon. Most of my clients rarely have activations, and they don't have anything that goes on for the length of time that this could go on. So I ask you really to think about that. And lastly, I've written a lot of books, and I don't normally pitch them on a webinar, but I have a really great book on crisis management that tells you everything that you must have in a program, and it lays it out in great recipe detail. So I'd encourage you to check it out if you think your plan is insufficient, because it's the hallmark and the base of what you're going to be doing. And then lastly, before I hand it back to Maria for questions, what I would say is if you are interested, follow me on LinkedIn. I post lots of information on a daily basis related to this particular outbreak and many other related issues in crisis management, but it's a good way for you to use me as a piece of your situational awareness. So I'm going to turn this back to Maria, and I'm happy to take any and all questions. Thank you, Regina, for a great presentation. Before we have our presenter address some of the questions that have been submitted throughout the program, I wanted to remind you that we would love your feedback in our webinar survey to help improve our program. And now for the first question. Should we be limiting travel to or through Southeast Asia countries now, or if not now, what needs to happen before we stop? That's a really great question. So in particular, if you look at the case count, uh, Thailand in particular has got a fair number of cases. Uh, Certainly you're seeing it in Singapore as well. It's also been in Cambodia and Vietnam. What I would say to you is in that region, I would ask the question, do you need to go? Is there a mission-critical time-sensitive reason for you to go there now? And if the answer is really no, then I I would suggest you defer travel for this period of time. Uh, And then I would have you reevaluate on a regular basis. The thing about it is, for example, in Singapore right now, there's 50-some cases, and they're actually finding all kinds of clusters that are appearing. 
Um, and so that what that means is that it is moving around the environment, and you could literally go there and be as careful as you possibly could be, but you could be in a situation where you're standing in line at a hotel, and next thing you know, you're uh, exposed to the virus. The guy that actually was infected uh, that infected a bunch of people that came from Britain, uh, a, a British citizen, started at a, at a conference in Singapore, flew to France, infected a bunch of people in France, and then he actually flew to uh, home in uh, Britain, and he went to a pub and had some beers, and he infected a bunch of people in the bar. So <laughs> you just never know. And so if you don't have to go, I wouldn't go to that part of the world right now. Okay. Should we be concerned with employees traveling back to the U.S. that connect through Hong Kong? and bringing back the coronavirus back to the office, especially if they're yes. asymptomatic? Yes. Anybody that's actually tra- trafficked to uh, mainland China or Hong Kong uh, should be on a 14-day stay at home when they come back. And if they don't have the PTO, it's the cheapest insurance you're ever going to buy. You just have them stay at home and work from home. And I would tell them they should social distance. So they should basically be self-isolating at home. Uh, and not not uh, going to the store or whatever because they could literally at some point be ill and they could be spreading the virus not knowing that they're sick. Okay. Do you have an infectious disease plan template that you can share with um, with the attendees so that they can start with uh, they can start with, within their company? That's a great question. We actually have a template, but we sell it. We don't give it away. We actually have done infectious disease consulting for years, and now we're actually selling our template as well as our services, but, you know, we don't give it away. Thank you. Okay. Is there a recommended absence threshold that businesses, schools, or others should consider closing? I'm sorry. What was the threshold question? I didn't, I didn't understand it. Is there a recommended absence? Me? Yeah. Is there a recommended absence threshold that businesses, schools, or others to consider before closing? That's a great question. Uh, at what point does it look like it's becoming serious? I think what I would do is that you would have to do a trend analysis and look back in your historic past. So in, and when we've had bad flu seasons, for example, 2009, it was a bad flu season last year. Uh, what did you see? What was your traditional uh, peak? So you know, we're still in the flu season. So you could actually all of a sudden, maybe your, your, um, your illness has increased by 10%, let's say. Um, is that normal? Have you had that happen before? Um, uh, what's the history of those people? I would probably do some epidemiology, which means researching and talking with the people about what, where, where they've been and what they've been doing before I would actually say, oh, my gosh, I need to close. If indeed you think that you have a spike that is really unusual, what I would do is I would reach out to the local department of public health and ask for their counsel, and they can help you kind of work through some epidemiology questions you might want to think about before you would make a decision to close. Okay. What type of gloves should be used to protect workers? That's a great question. Uh, most most commonly, people are using nitrile gloves because they uh, that helps deal with people with latex allergies. Uh, latex gloves are fine, but they do have there are a lot of people that are allergic to latex, so latex or nitrile gloves are fine, uh, and they would need to change them with some regularity because. Again, if you, I, I've, I've been through, you know, at the airport, I fly 200,000 miles a year, so I'm often seeing a TSA um, officer who's got gloves on his hand and they're touching their nose, they're touching their face. And so um, if you're going to have gloves on, you need to make sure that you change them on some regularity and that you keep your hands, to your, you know, away from your face. Okay. Can coronavirus be a factor on products arriving from China? That's a great question. Could the virus uh, be still uh, active when something arrives from China? Uh, the virus studies have not been done for this particular virus that I am aware of on, on uh, surfaces. Most viruses will actually die within about 48, 72 hours. So if something was on a, on a, on a piece of equipment that came from China and now it's been in transit, I'm sure it's way beyond that 72-hour time frame. So I would not be so concerned about that. Okay. Should one avoid going to public gatherings? flying in planes or going on a cruise? That's a really great question. Uh, public gatherings. So there are some places that are much more germ-ridden than others, I guess is what I would say. Um, uh, yeah, you might have noticed that in the last few days, there's been some major conferences that have canceled. Uh, because of the fear and the anxiety related to the disease, also because many people might have been coming from Asia and there was a concern that they might have been bringing it with them. So I think uh, my suggestion would be is this. If I was going to go on a cruise, I might think twice about it right now. Uh, and I'm, I apologize to any cruise line owners that would be on the 
uh, listening to this webinar. But I, I just look at what's happened to, to several ships that are out there, and, and again, you just don't know what's going on. So I would be, if you're going to be on a cruise, I would be hyper, hyper, hyper vigilant about my hands, washing them all the time. And, and every time you touch a handrail, you better wash them again. So I'd be super, super vigilant if I was going to be on a cruise. Uh, for a conference, I think I would probably have minimal concerns about that unless all of a sudden we started having a lot of outbreak in the United States. But at this point, I think I would be less concerned about that in the U.S. Okay. What recommendations do you have for churches as they often um, offer closer contact than most businesses? Yeah, so if you're in a church environment, I think one of the things I would have people begin to think about is that, you know, is there any, um, is there any part of your service where people are physically touching each other? Like sometimes they might reach out and touch somebody's hand or, you know, I would ask you to really think about that in, in passing communions. If you're in a church that does that kind of thing, you know, would you want people to be handling something with their fingers, um, uh, and putting something in somebody's mouth or giving it to them by hand? So I think you need to sort of think about anything where you have close contact with each other. Uh, really skin to skin uh, would be my concern. I think if you're sitting in a, in a pew next to somebody, that's really not much different than sitting on a plane. But I think it's, if you're en ending up being physically in contact with somebody where the issue becomes a problem. Okay. How long can coronavirus survive at below ambient temperatures? These, uh, this attendee is thinking about frozen and refrigerated foods imported from China. Oh, that's a really great question. So, uh, I, your concern is, is the virus cannot, cannot survive being frozen. So if you're getting products from China, that would not be an issue. Or for that matter, if you're getting, you know, um, uh, soy sauce or tofu or something like that, I don't think you need to be concerned about that. And the virus cannot survive well, uh, after a period of time. So, um, I would not be worried about frozen foods and things that have been processed. Okay. How long will it take to develop and implement a flu shot for this new virus? Um, that's a good question. It's not the flu, so it would not be a flu shot, but it would be a, um, um, a vaccination. Uh, currently, right now, there's a bunch of different companies that are aggressively chasing this. And the, the best, 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 best uh, uh, case scenario is that it would be developed in about 18 months. But as far as being widely available, you're probably talking to several years, a couple years at least. Last question. Please define BIA and BCP. Oh, great. Thank you. So I'm sorry for that acronym. So BIA stands for Business Impact Analysis, and it's where a company evaluates what's time-sensitive and mission-critical by department. So you would actually have a good understanding of what was potentially at risk in your business. So that's the formal business impact analysis. It's a really effective assessment. A business continuity plan or those things is a plan that you would write for those departments that have time-sensitive and mission-critical business processes that must be done. And normally you're really looking at that 7 to 14-day window of where you may not be able to work in your normal fashion, and you would actually need a plan about how you would recover that business process in maybe a remote location or in more difficult situations um, than your, your usual work uh, environment. Okay, one last question. What answer do you have for those that say this is just like the seasonal flu? That's a really great question. There's a huge amount of comparison about this to the seasonal flu. So first of all, the seasonal flu, depending on the year, will have a fatality rate usually around 0.1%, sometimes 0.01%. Um, so this has a fatality rate right now of 2.3%. So it's, you know, a lot more fatal. So that's the first thing. The second thing is this virus has never circulated before. And so the flu virus, as we know, and it mutates and changes all the time, which I totally understand, but it is um, uh, something that we have exposure to so many of us have had versions of the flu. So what that means is that when you get the flu, generally speaking, you aren't normally as sick as you possibly could be. When you're confronted with a brand new disease that's never existed before, then when it hits you, depending on your immune system, your overall health uh, profile and your history of uh, other illnesses, it can be super debilitating because you've never been exposed to this before. So it's very different than saying it's just like the seasonal flu. I think people say that to make people not be afraid, which I think is important. I don't want to make anybody afraid. I want them to be aware, and then I want them to do something. And that's really the important thing that I'm looking for 
in sharing information and all the consulting that we do. We want people to be smart and be aware and not um, and not get caught um, off guard. Okay. That is all the time we have for questions today. Please join me in thanking Regina Phelps for her presentation as well as our sponsor, Everbridge. If you do have any additional questions or comments, please don't hesitate to click the email us button on the console. And please visit securitymagazine.com for the archive of this presentation, as well as information about other upcoming events. We appreciate your time, your great questions, and we hope that you have found this webinar to be a valuable experience.